Good morning. The sanctuary looks a little sparse this morning, but that's okay. We welcome each of you who has chosen to come and worship today. We welcome each of you out there who have chosen to worship electronically or however you may be doing it. Um, it is good to worship wherever and whenever and however we do it. Um, as you notice, Pastor John is not with us today. Uh, he and Tasha and Cyrus are having a little, a little break, a little vacation, mini one, not what they had planned, but, uh, but at least able to get away for a, for a little bit. And so we're uh, happy to have um, our resident chaplain, Jim, <laughs> bring us the message this morning. Um, you have probably all had Chex Mix. Um, my mom used to make it at Christmas time, and there was a bowl sitting around. I, I used to do it too until I got really lazy. But you know, the rice Chex, wheat Chex, corn Chex, some pretzels, some nuts, you know, whatever you feel like putting in, maybe a little Worcestershire sauce. Well, I found a recipe this week for something that seemed fitting for Thanksgiving. Um, it's called a blessing mix. And these are the ingredients. Bugles. These represent the cornucopia, a symbol of abundance. Mini pretzels represent arms folded in thanks and prayer. Goldfish crackers represent a likely staple food at the first Thanksgiving. Fish were a big part of the Native American's diet. Candy corn represent the sacrifices of the first pilgrim's first winter. Nuts represent the promise of future harvest if seeds are planted and tended with care. Dried fruit represent the bountiful fruits of the earth gathered in at harvest time. M&Ms, my favorite. Sweet memories of those who sacrifice so much that we might enjoy freedom in a blessed land. Hershey's Kisses, the love of family and friends who surround us during the holidays and enrich our lives all year long. And I might add to this mix, instead of Worcestershire sauce, maybe a little John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, those who believe in him, that we might have everlasting life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious, generous, loving God, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving. We're grateful, Lord, for the cornucopia of abundance that we've been given. We thank you for the wonder of your creation, and we praise you when we see your your sunshine, your magnificent sunsets, and the world and all that you created around us. We thank you for this Thanksgiving season, O oh Lord, and help us to always be thankful in each season of our lives, in seasons of joy, in seasons of sorrow, in seasons of anxiety and uncertainty, Lord, help us to be thankful in all those times because we have hope in you and we have hope, the hope of eternal life that you have given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Be with um, the Fillmore family as they travel and give them respite, rest, relaxation, and a little fun. Be with Jim as he brings your word 
And Lord, we ask that you would open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to your message. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the Psalms. Psalm chapter 139, verses 1 through 18. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained me for, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Good morning. Hymn number, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 516 in the red hymnal. Let's stand, shall we? When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings.
Denzel, do you want to come up, buddy? I don't want to leave you out. I have a legend for you, the legend of five kernels. Do you know what this week is? Do you know what we're celebrating? Probably something. Always a good answer. Uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is what we're celebrating. Do you remember learning in school the story of the pilgrims and how they got to America? If you don't remember, I have a quick summary for you. So, first of all, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I'm so thankful you're here this morning. The traditional way of celebrating Thanksgiving is by eating a huge meal as fast as you possibly can, right? Right? Grandma and mom and sometimes dad and grandpa help cook it and then you just devour it fast. Yeah. Well, it didn't start out that way, um, but we do have the turkey and the gravy and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and cranberry sauce. But before digging into the feast that lays before us on the table, you know, we usually stop and say what we're thankful for. Do you guys have that tradition at home on Thanksgiving? You say some things you're thankful for. The pilgrims did it. When the pilgrims were coming over to America, they wanted a land where they could, you know, believe in God and worship God and go to church. And so <clears throat> that's how they got here. But things were not easy when they got to America. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how to grow crops. They didn't know how to raise animals here. And things were pretty rough that first year. A lot of them starved. And they met some people that first Thanksgiving that they were Native Americans. And they helped the pilgrims survive. And so the second winter, though, it was really, really hard again. Um, they didn't have enough food. The pilgrims didn't have enough food. And there were times where they were only allowed five kernels of corn to eat. That's it. Can you imagine if that was your dinner? I'd never make it, guys. For the whole day, five kernels of corn. But the people had faith that God would take care of them. And God did. God sent them the Native Americans who helped them learn how to plant crops and raise animals and harvest the crops. So the second Thanksgiving, they had so much food, they didn't even know what they were going to do with it all. So they had their friends, the Native Americans, there was a chief called Chief um, Massasoit, and he came with his wife, and he had a whole bunch of other chiefs, and there was about 120 um, Native American braves that ate with them. Five kernels of corn wasn't going to be enough. So they had a whole bunch of food, so much food they couldn't even count it all. But to remind everyone of the hard times, they stopped in front of an empty plate and they had just five kernels of corn on their plate. And each person went around and they took one of those kernels one at a time and they said what they were thankful for. And that was to remind them of the suffering they had been through, but that God had provided for them when they didn't think there was a way. So I'm going to give you each a bag with five kernels of corn in it. And um, this is corn that I had. It's old. I wouldn't recommend cooking it or even planting it. But you can have some corn. And I know in a time of 
social distancing, I probably shouldn't be handing you things, but, um, oh, did I count wrong? Well, on Thanksgiving, remember your kernels of corn and give thanks for what you have and what you've had through this year. And our year hasn't been as hard as the pilgrims. And we are so thankful for God's grace in that. So we'll pray and then we can go back to our seats or go to our class. Good and gracious God, there's so much for which to thank you. I'm sure we can think of more than five things. We know that all of the people and things that you've given us keep us safe and warm and happy. We know all of that comes from you. Lord, I thank you for the people we love and the people who love us and for the beautiful things in this world that you've provided, Lord. And for our many blessings, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Let's stand and sing the doxology. That's what, how I know it. And I know the short version. I'm not so sure about the long version here. Are, are we going to try? Short version. Good. Okay, I know that one. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him, all heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And then we are so blessed. And I don't have a copy of it, so I'll sing with you up here. We are so blessed. The gifts of your hand I can't understand Why you love us so much We are so blessed For the words that can say Please be seated. I have a hard time thinking that Sue was lazy when she said that. Um, known Sue for a long time, not a lazy person. But there was this, uh, there was this an event where there was a big crowd and the... Um, uh, the leader who was up front said, um, we're going to have a contest of who is the laziest person. Everybody think, if you're the laziest person, raise your hand. Everybody raised their hand except for one person, this young, this man. And the leader said, well, he's so lazy, he didn't even raise his hand. So, sir, you have won. Would you come up front? I have a $100 gift card for you. And he said, uh, actually, can you come put it in my pocket for me? That's pretty lazy. Yeah, there's a few people in my life where I hear lazy, and, and Amber will say, oh, I had a lazy day today. Well, I, Amber's not a lazy person. Anyway, uh, John 16, 33. We're going to bounce around to a few different scriptures uh, this morning. So we'll be in John. We'll be in the book of Daniel, the third chapter. Maybe a little bit in Exodus chapter 14. 
But today's verse is at the end of a little section where Jesus is talking to his disciples. Maybe even some of you at this point, uh, this eight months into this craziness of the world, have read this scripture a few times yourself. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. To me that brings a lot of peace at this time of, of knowing that even though there's all these things going on and problems, Jesus has said, I've got, I've got this. Have you stopped to think uh, here lately or pondered as believers, as we go through our lives, if we think of why is there, why am I sometimes, it's so hard. Why is it so difficult, so agonizing? Why am I suffering through this? Why are the problems? I think the last eight months we've all probably had some of those questions. Some of the new problems I think that we've all faced are questions like, or things that are problem, problems that are happening, our loved ones are isolated. They can't um, go see their family members at this time. Hospital workers and medical professionals have worries of, well, is the virus going to affect me really bad, or am I going to kind of go through and nothing happen? Or am I going to get it and it's going to take me down? Those are things that the medical community have to worry about on a daily basis. We have had things with the election. Not going to go into politics today, but just on the normal way that an election goes, it's a little smoother, obviously, than the way it's going this year. There's, it's complicated. We've had rioting. We've had violence. We've had civil unrest. And the list goes on. And, and this is, doesn't even come into account of the normal things in life that bring us down, right? Normal problems of illness, of death of loved ones, sadness, family tension at times. But I'd like for us today, when we think of Thanksgiving time, and there's lots for us to be thankful for, and we can go down through the list of, of, that we all have of what we are thankful for. We're thankful for our health. We're thankful for our family we're thankful for uh, our ability to come and worship. We're thankful for our country. But I'd like to stop and for us to think a little bit more. Are we thankful for the problems that we're having? Or should our lives be easy because we're Christians? Should we just have a pass and everything be peaches and cream and we whistle a merry tune everywhere we go and we never have any problems? Is that really what we feel or think that our lives should be like? Should it just all be a walk in the park with no problems at all for us to face? Eating ice cream and singing kumbaya with each other. Really? Really think about that. Is that really what we as Christians should experience? Today I'd like to cover three different areas that kind of fit into uh, John 16, 33. One, our lives will have problems and trials. It's not if, it's when. Second, we're not alone on this journey. And third, be of good cheer, take heart. Or, and this week we could say, be thankful and joyful. I want to share a story a little bit. Some of you may know a little bit of this story. I'll try not to go into too many details because the life of this man was really amazing and what he went through. The story of Louis Zamperini, uh, Unbroken. Uh, if you've read the book or you've seen the movie, the book is way better. Um, uh, the movie was good, but they really didn't touch on the spiritual component of Louis toward the end as, as much as uh, probably should have happened. But I'd like to take just a few minutes to kind of give you a summary of some of the things that he went through in his life, the problems that he faced. So just kind of taking the lead from uh, the source that I looked at from history.com, kind of broke it down into eight different areas of, of Louis's life. So starting off, Louis was a juvenile delinquent to start off. 
There's no better really way to say that, that other than he was the definition in the dictionary of a little pill, a little troublemaker. He was, he was a bad little boy, okay? Um, let's, to put it into perspective, he was smoking at the age of five, okay? He was drinking at the age of eight. He didn't turn away from fights, stealing, and just a whole lot of mischief. And probably if it wasn't for his big brother, who kind of got him into athletics, specifically running, the story of Louis probably would have been a lot different than what it was. So secondly, he started running and getting into athletics. Kind of de derailed him, kind of re re reshaped his direction and put some of this energy and this, these troubles of his life into running. And he was good at it. And he was fast. So he started running. He made the Olympic team in 1936. He was on the Olympic team as a mile runner. One of the fastest. He actually got to meet, um, not that, you know, was a great person by any means, was not. It was an evil person, but he actually got to shake hands with, with Hitler himself who said, oh, you're, one of the, you're the fast runner. He still has some mischief in him because uh, on that trip to Berlin, he actually tried to steal one of the Nazi flags and got into a little bit of trouble there. So there was still that little bit of honoriness uh, that Louis had, and which probably, to his credit, helped him in a lot of ways as he started facing other problems. So Louis was on track to becoming one of the fastest mile runners in the country. A lot of people were saying, this guy is probably going to break the four-minute mile barrier. I mean, I can't even imagine that. You know, maybe a mile, a mile in less than four minutes. Okay? So he, he, he was fast. But all that kind of got derailed. Uh, the war started in 1939. His hopes of going to the next Olympics was shut down. 1941, he joined uh, the military and he started his uh, short career as uh, being a bombardier on a B-24. Interesting on that one, I'm a plane guy, so I, I love learning about planes, old planes, new planes. I think that the, the nickname for the B-24 Liberator was the Flying Coffin. I don't know if how, how much of you about you, but getting on, the, on, on a plane with the nickname the Flying Coffin, yeah, I don't know. So he was uh, on this plane as a bombardier for a, a period of time, and it says he cheated death a few times. Um, his plane would come back a couple, of, a couple of different missions, barely making it back. Hydraulic, hydraulic fluid leaking from the plane. On one of the missions back, had, they counted as they did their post-trip check, over 600 bullet holes in this plane, and they made it back. Well, his luck kind of ran out, uh, and their plane was shot down over the Pacific, and uh, only three of them survived the crash. And him and only one other guy, after 47 days of being lost at sea, after that crash, were picked up by the Japanese Navy, which was not a good thing, by the way. By reading this book, as I spent time in it, it was like, it was like, oh, man, it can't get any worse than this, right? And then it got worse. You know, and then, oh, you know, on, out on the lifeboat, and they had to, they'd have to go underneath the boat at times because they were getting scraped. But uh, the Japanese would come in, and they had to go underneath their boat, and they'd have to repair their boat. I mean, it was just amazing the things that he went through. So he's picked up by the, the Japanese, where he spent now the next two years of his life in a prisoner of war camp, a very bad place to be. His time there was filled with torture. His living conditions were very harsh. No medical assistance. Lack of good nutrition and other just basic necessities of life and, and problems and illnesses that they had to go through with no medical attention. So again, his life got worse. Next part of that is they scooped him out of the camp knowing that he was um, 
very well known as the runner uh, back in the United States and tried to get him to sell propaganda and had a statement for him to read on the airwaves of, of, you read this and we'll take you out of the camp. Your life will now be peaches and cream. It'll be all right, but you've got to read this little statement about your country. The only thing that he would do was send a message and said that his, he was still alive to his mom and dad and he wouldn't read the other statement and he was sent back to the camp. Time went by. He was able to. They were rescued out of this horrible prisoner of war camp. But as many of the soldiers uh, that we know when they come out of a trauma situation, uh, Louis had a lot of problems. He had a lot of mental stress, what we would call today PTSD. He got into alcohol, became an alcoholic. His relationships were strained until in 1949, he went to a big crusade, a very well-known preacher crusade at the time. Any guesses? Billy Graham. Someone had talked him into going to see Billy Graham at a crusade where he accepted the Lord, and his life changed. He started a youth camp for troubled youth. Imagine that. I couldn't imagine, you know, he, he could really speak well to the youth about his troubles, and it did well. But did his life become easy after his conversion? We'd have to say no. I'm sure he had bumps along the road, you know, even even just because he accepted the Lord. All his troubles didn't go away. And we know that for ourselves as well. The troubles don't go away just because we have Jesus in our hearts. But his gratefulness, he was able to praise the Lord through all of this and even go back to Japan years later and try to have reconciliation with some of the guards that treated him so badly in the POW camp. How many of us would do that? Go back to a place that you were tortured for two years to try to make that reconciliation to give God the glory through all of that. I'll let us also to think a little bit of how his eyes were probably opened. Like Saul when his conversion and the scales fell off of his eyes. It must have been similar to that for, for Louis at that time. And giving credit to God through it all. Think of some of the other circumstances of, of some of our Bible heroes, if we won't call them that today. And the things that they went through, even knowing God of what they went through, it wasn't peaches and cream and a walk in the park. Think of Noah. Not many of us have been tasked to build an ark, right? Anybody here? No. To be ridiculed for that. Moses and all that he went through. David, Job, Daniel, Ruth, Paul, Peter, the list goes on, and even Christ himself what he had to go through. I'd like for us to remember, if you, if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, let's remember that trio back in Daniel that went into the fiery furnace. The section of that I would like to read is from chapter 3. Verses 16, 17, and 18. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they were, had positions under King Nebuchadnezzar. So they weren't just people out in the, in the countryside. They, they were kind of, uh, had some management. They had some duties under the king. So when the whole decree happened and King Nebuchadnezzar made the golden idol and said you must worship it, those three did not do that. They were children of the Most High God. That did not please Nebuchadnezzar one bit. Leaders under his regime were not doing what they'd been commanded and ordered to do. So he brought them forth. But their response to me is great uh, of, of when they're brought forth to the king 
And he wants an explanation, and he gives them basically a second chance. I've heard that this has happened. You haven't worshipped the idol that I've made, but if you do it now, we'll, we'll call it good. And this is the response that the three made. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. That's an interesting response if you think about it. We don't, have to, we don't have to speak on this behalf, on this matter. If this is the case, meaning if we're going to be thrown into the furnace because we will not worship your gods, in this case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, which is an interesting, another interesting part of this story in the language that they use. But if, if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image that you have set up. And that was their answer. They are allowing God's glory to speak. And that's the answer that they gave the king. We'll, we'll come back to the, the trio here in a little bit. But our road of being a follower of Jesus may not send us to a death. It may not mean that we are going to be beheaded because of our beliefs or stoned or crucified. But our suffering in this day and age may look a little different for our faith in the Lord. Questions that I thought of maybe during this eight months that you know, people might come to us and, and uh, question our faith or, or how do we answer people when they say, how, how do you have so much peace and joy in this time of, of craziness in 2020? How do we answer that? How are we willing to answer that? Maybe when people ask you, what do you mean that you believe that all lives matter? What, what do you mean? Or how come your God allowed my loved one to die a miserable, lonely death in a hospital that I couldn't go see? How do we answer that? Suffering comes in many shapes and sizes and ways. Is our response to suffering pointing to our God that has helped us through these things? Are they pointing to a loving, knowing, and compassionate God? Now we throw in the book of James there's a great line, or not line, a great verse right in the beginning of James. And I think you all can, I think that we've been studying in some of the Sunday school classes the book of James. One of my favorites, not because I share the same name, um, but one of my favorites, but one of the hardest as well. When we think of a time of thanksgiving, we could easily have a sermon about all the great and wonderful things that we can be thankful for. But I would challenge us to be thankful today and this week for the problems that come into our life. That's a little harder. Remember James. What does it say in James 1? Verse 2. Count it all what? Joy when we face trials, problems, and tribulations. Really, James, really do you have to, to bring that up? Do we have to try to be happy about all these things? And then remember, we give... To remember to give God the glory through all of our trials, all of our problems and tribulations. When those times come, that we say, thank you, Lord. Because it brings us closer to him. And not only that, he gets the glory for our transformations and our time through difficult circumstances. Sometimes I wonder if we should do like some of the people in, in athletics do. After they make a touchdown, I like to watch football. You know, after they make a touchdown or they score, and what do they do afterward? They get down and they might go, you know, like this, or, you know, they point to heaven, you know, give God the glory. 
Sometimes I wonder if we, you know, I mean, not to be uh, jokingly, but to, for us too, when someone asks us a hard question and we're able to say, you know, I have peace because of the Lord. That's when our faith should really shine is when we can say, God has pulled me through. There's no other reason why I feel the way I do or I have peace or joy during this troubled time. It's because of God. The second point this morning is that we're never alone. God doesn't leave us high and dry during these difficult, trying times. These storms that we go through, we're not alone. Do we feel alone at times? I think the answer is yes. We can feel alone. Or even Christ in the garden when he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God doesn't leave us alone. Maybe God sends a friend into our lives to help us. Maybe God sends us as a friend to somebody else who's having a difficult time. Now I'd like to go back into our three fiery friends back in Daniel and think a little bit more of of their circumstance. But as we do, start filtering through our, our our own problems, our trials, and remembering that God didn't leave us alone during those times. So, with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what does the king say as he saw amongst them in the furnace the three? Anybody remember? What does he see? Three went in, but, whoa, yes, what? Exactly. Thank you. There was someone else in there with them. And they had the form, some translations say, it was the form of an angel. A heavenly being was in there. My translation says the form of almost like the Son of God. So whether or not it was one of God's angels that were with these three, or if it was Jesus himself, the three were not left alone in the fiery furnace. I think that's a very important as we move forward, thinking about our own trials, our own problems, God does not leave us alone. They came out unharmed without even a smell of smoke on their garments, without a a hair singed on their head. It's an amazing story. Is the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah, to some degree, but who does it point the glory to? To God. He came in. He was with them. He saved them. He rescued them because of their faith. I've met several people this year uh, on the duties and and ministry that I have, and and some of them have been vets. And some of them are having, as, as many combat vets do, Stress and PTSD. There's, uh, I've heard it called not just stress disorder. I, I think a better word that fits is post-traumatic stress injury. That there was an injury that's happened. And one of the things when I sit and listen to their stories and them going through their problems and trials is that they know that they're not alone. That they have someone that will listen. That they've had people in their lives that have helped them through those difficult times. I've been reminding them when I've had the chance is that they are not alone. That God loves them. They are not forgotten. Sometimes we have to be God's reps. His representation in this torn and broken world. A friend of mine, he would say when we'd pray, uh, that worked, I worked with him for years, Mike, he would say, well, you know, we pray that we can be God's hands and feet extended to the world. That's a beautiful picture, if you think of it, of God working through us uh, to help others. But not for our glory, but for the glory of God. Who has been that person for you, as we think today? 
You might have people in your lives that you think of during your really darkest moments where someone stepped in and, and stood along you, alongside of you during those times. Or can we, or do we have people in our lives today that we know that need us to step alongside of them? People deliver. I have an aunt that's in a facility, and it's, it's very sad because I haven't been able to see her other than going to the window. Um, she has friends from the Boise Valley Church where she would normally attend that would come pick her up, that bring her little goodie baskets. She can't remember where they're coming from. Her memory is very bad, but they show up. The gifts show up, and it brings joy to her. Someone is being God's and hands extended. They're not alone. And it's not about us. I can't say that enough uh, today as we look and we're thankful for all the things that, that, that happen that are good, but also to be thankful for those things that make us stretch and make us cry and that we have hard times with, that it's not about us. It's about God. In Rick Warren's bur- a book, a purpose-driven life, and we went through that years ago uh, as a church. We went through that study, The Purpose-Driven di- uh, Life. In the very first chapter, I've used this quote in this, with this group before, but it always reminds me of, of where, we should, where should I be. Does anybody have read that book, know what that first sentence is in the first chapter? It's not about me. All that we go through, it's not about me. It's not about us. I think us humans can be whiners sometimes. I I know I can put myself into that category too. When things are not going well, um, we can can get into that that pity, that pity pity party or the pity puddle, whatever you want to call it. And we say, woe is me. And I think that's part of being a human at times is that we, that we stumble in that area. But I thought of, too, when we think about when Jesus, when God helps us through things, think of how he told the, the, one of the, the, when he healed the guy at the well and um, he, he, he was able to come out up out of the water and Jesus just said to him, pick up your mat and Go. Or pick up your mat and live life. Pick up your, your mat and, and give God the glory. Continue with your life. Don't be stuck in, oh, all these things happened to me. Maybe share that story with others. But don't finish it with that. Finish it with, I went through a really hard time. But praise the Lord, God help me. What about our fire-laden friends again in the Old Testament? After they came out of the furnace, and the king, and it says the king and the counselors came out, and they kind of inspected them. They, 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 they checked them out. They looked them over. You know, that's how they will say, man, they, they haven't even been singed. I can't smell smoke on them. I can, there's nothing. I can, can tell that they were in this furnace. But what does the trio say at this point in time? What does the trio say? The answer? Zero. They say nothing. To me, as I read this, and how many times have we heard this story, and, and, and sometimes when you prepare a sermon, a lot of it is for yourself. I mean, you, you learn a lot, right? You, 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 when any time that you teach or you, you're preparing, it's like, oh, I needed, to, I needed to hear that. But what that was speaking to me when I read that was that they didn't have to say a word because God, God's glory had already happened. The miracle happened without them, humans, us, having to interject. Oh, man, did you see how, how I just, you know, got into the fire and, you know, check me out. I, I didn't get burnt or anything. No, there was, there was nothing said. They didn't have to say a single word because God had already said plenty, right? He had said plenty by the act of saving them in the furnace. 
So sometimes I think we have to get out of the way so we can give God the glory. All the glory was given to God, not the trio, not the humans. The trio kept their mouths shut, stepped aside, and let God do his thing. And what's important in that story also, the young fellow on the back there said it, he was not alone. They were not alone through all of that. There was a fourth in the fire with them. And again, it wasn't about them. The third point, and sometimes the harder one for us as as Christians, as believers, and as we go through our life's journey, and that is being of good cheer through all of this. Being grateful, being thankful, being joyful. Again, James, when it says, my brethren or my friends, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Typically, we don't really want to go into trials and have problems in our lives. It's it's hard. It can be very, very straining mentally, physically, all of these things. But as I think today, of the three things, we will have suffering. We can't avoid it. We are going to be in it. We're not going to be alone. But being of good cheer and counting it all joy is part of our challenge. And I think this is where the rubber really meets the road. And that's what I remember a philosophy teacher I had in Boise State. He would say, you don't want to be a toad when the rubber meets the road. Meaning that we had a test coming, and if we weren't studied up, we were going to be the toad, and he was going to be the tire running over us. We were going to get flattened. But I think as Christians, we have to remember, this is where where it starts counting, right? We have to be joyful in all things. That doesn't mean we're happy. It means that we can say, through it all, and even in our tears, we can say, "It it was about God, and he pulled me through. We are made for the deep waters. I think of us sometimes as, as seaworthy ships. And God designed us to be out in the sea, out in the ocean, in the deep waters, in the stormy waters at times. We're not meant to be tied up to the dock. We are meant to be out in the world, sharing the good news, telling others of what God has done for us. Sometimes we have to be at the dock and we have to have some rest and repair where John and Tasha and Cyrus this week. But God does call us out into the deep waters, into the stormy waters. For why? To give him the glory. So the other part of John 16, 13 that we that we talk about but is so important to our journey is the be of good cheer as we come into Thanksgiving week. There's so much to be thankful for. But what helps me on this, as we know, as we go into life struggles and trials and we try to be of good cheer and we know sometimes we're not going to be and sometimes we're grumpy and we don't portray the things that we should in our faith. The other and the last part of that verse of 1613 or 1633 is after he says, but be of good cheer, he ends the verse by saying, I have overcome the world. I have overcome COVID. I have overcome the elections. I have overcome the riots, the violence, all of these things. Jesus has saying, as he's about to leave his disciples and be crucified a horrible death, take heart. It's okay what you're going through because I've overcome the world. Do we have a willing, a willingness to let God be God and not stand in the way at times during our, our difficulties and give God the credit and the glory As you start looking back and as you read your Bible on some of these accounts 
throughout, throughout the Bible, it's always pointing back to giving God the glory. Think of the parting of the Red Sea. It was not about Moses, although Moses is a great uh, our character. I love Moses. I love, I love his humanness uh, of failure and doing things wrong, but God still works through him. He was not a good speaker, but God said, that's okay. I'll, I'll help you through all of this. And then, you know, Moses is just a tool for God to part the Red Sea. And what he says in there, I think, is beautiful um, to um, the Israelites as they are getting ready to get over here. Excuse me. As they're pinned up against the sea and the Egyptians are getting ready to overtake them and they're thinking, Moses, what are you doing? We could have just stayed in Egypt. At least we're not going to get killed out here by the sea out in the wilderness. And Moses says to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall shall hold your peace. We always have someone in our corner. In that corner, we have Jesus, the conqueror of the world with us. I carry a a saying in my binder uh, throughout the week that I found from Mother Teresa It's a great quote, and I don't read it every day, but I know it's there, and sometimes I need to read it, and it's a really good reminder for me. And she she said this, God doesn't call me to be successful. God calls me to be faithful. That's where we need to be. For all of this, all that we go through, we have to remember, in the midst of the, our, our most horrible suffering, when we, it's easy for us to say, woe is me, if we could just say, it's not about me. It's about God's glorification that he is in charge and that he's going to be with me through all of these horrible things. And give him the glory and the praise. I have to say, uh, as I was finishing this up, um, I have an uncle that's in um, Florida, um, my dad's brother-in-law, um, Uncle Jim, and he's been in the hospital for the last uh, week with COVID. Uh, when he entered in the hospital, um, the doctor said they're worried about him. He is a high-risk person. He has a lot of health concerns. A lot of people. He's a, he's a, uh, Jim is a, a huge man of faith. He's not a huge man. He's a he's huge man of faith. <laughs> um, he called at the end as I was just kind of putting my stuff away to just let me know that he had made it home. He's doing well. But, but through what he said, I had to share with you today because it fit just right in. He, he said, through all of this that I've gone through in the past week at the VA hospital there in Gainesville, Florida, he says, I've learned a new maturity in my life with Christ. That's where we need to be. What am I learning from what God, you know, is that, that we're allowed to go through? God is so good. Let's always give him the praise and the glory. Amen. As we finish today, um, there, there's a song. It's um, 1027 in your supplement. I think we'll just sing the first um, two verses. Uh, it's, in, in my life, Lord, be glorified, and in your church, uh, Lord, be glorified. And that's how we'll end uh, our, our time together today. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my heart, Lord, be glorified today. In my church. In our church, Lord, be glorified.
As we leave this place, know that we are going to go through problems, but we're never alone, and be of good cheer. Have a blessed week.